Yeah, Kirk hasn't even been on the ship long enough to see how the ship operates. Kirk is running around yelling, like, we need to go forward. Your father would be proud. <laughs> so Pike, Kirk, Spock, they're in the Enterprise. They're coming into an emergency situation that they know about. They know about the emergency situation. Did they jump in too close? Let's watch. Arrival at Vulcan in five seconds. Four, three, two. Oh, Whoa! They're way too close, right? There's wreckage everywhere. They could have they could have jumped in, I don't know, a little bit farther back. Not so close to Vulcan, so they wouldn't be in danger. What's the procedure here? I see what you're saying. So, okay, so first thing is, did they know that it was this level of emergency? Like, they knew that there was an emergency on Vulcan, and they knew that the rest of the fleet had jumped ahead because because mm -hmm. Sulu didn't take out the parking brake. Yeah. So if they think things are going well, then this might be an okay place. Like, this, like if the fleet had been further up, it could have been okay. The fleet might only be here broken because it engaged a narrow ship and they got all messed up. So this, this might have been okay. Mm, that being said, I guess there's a balance. Like, you shouldn't jump too far away. So, so, so if someone needs to jump into the Earth system, you want them to, be, to help us. Right? You want them to be close to Earth. If they jump in at... Uranus or Neptune, then they're like, yeah. we've jumped in, we're here to help, but we need to travel by impulse power for seven hours. Like you're too far away. Right? So there's right. somehow a balance. Like you'd want to jump close, but not too close. That's right. So if you go too far away, it's just going to take too much time. If you jump too close, you crash. Right. So this does seem like a happy medium because they jump right. looks like they jump right into above the surface of Vulcan. Right. It makes sense. And they need to be right in the action. And if they need to teleport people away or they need to send shuttles down to Vulcan to help them, then like you can't you can't be too far away. There's a there's a maximum range for both of those objects, both of those transportation right. methods. And, and I guess in Star Trek, you don't they don't do they don't do intra system jumps. Like you don't jump you wouldn't jump from Earth to Mars. You just impulse it, right? Or heck, even further away, like Earth to Pluto. You wouldn't jump that. You'd impulse it. Is that is that right? I guess so. Because they I think. use they use impulse power within solar systems, as far as I can tell. I guess it's not always spelled out, but I don't think they use warp within solar systems. So I guess you, if you jumped too far away, because you're cautious, you don't know, you like you mm -hmm. jump into the edge of a solar system, then you can assess the situation and then jump away, then come back. Maybe. I don't know, I don't know how long it would take to turn around and re-vector. Like... But it's all time. If they want to get in there as fast as possible, make a difference. They need to get in there, which yep. is risky, but yep. it's also actually, you need to get in there to help right away. So maybe this is okay. They kind of miscalculated because they jump into a place where they could have gotten destroyed Correct. without even yeah. a shot fired, but that could have been the calculation. So, and maybe this was an okay place to jump into, into the Vulcan system. If like, if they had not thought about if they, if there hadn't been a fight, and so fights, like they drag out, they drift over time. Like it's not, the battlefield is mm -hmm. not where you plan it to be. It, it evolves, it goes wherever wherever it goes, right? So maybe right. this would have been okay if the fleet had not been attacked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess later on in a debrief, if everybody survives, they can figure out like what went wrong and mm -hmm. should we have changed our jump coordinates based on the information we had and then update procedures later. But right now it seems okay. I think so. Sometimes you just got to... You put that looking. You gotta roll a hard six. And it worked out. You gotta roll a hard six. Oh, we should do Battlestar. It's such a good show. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So at the same time, so I guess no, not slightly after the Pike Pike chooses uh, an away team for for an assault mm -hmm. for assault on the drill. Yeah. And he chooses engineer Olsen, he chooses helmsman Sulu and uh whatever whatever job job um whatever. Kirk has. But <laughs> not supposed why? to be here. Yeah. Officers who've been trained in advanced hand-to-hand -hand combat. I have training, sir. Come with me. Kirk, you too. You're not supposed to be here anyway. So I get Sulu because he says I have advanced hand-to-hand -hand combat, which and, mm -hmm. and which which Pike requests. He requests officers with advanced hand-to-hand -hand training. So Pike is expecting there to be fights, but the only time Pike has ever seen Kirk fight is Kirk losing, like getting getting beat up, getting messed up. So why why does Pike choose Kirk? He's only seen him lose. 
So he says he chooses Kirk because he's not supposed to be here anyway, which implies expendability, which is weird. Um, I mean, but then somehow, go ahead. It's got a point because if you want to keep all your officers positioned at their stations, so that way the ship can mm-hmm. operate. And as of now, Kirk has no job. So it's, you know, if, if he's there on the ship or he's not on the ship, the ship functions just the same. It is kind of a sink or swim situation because Pike is trying to pull Kirk up through the ranks quickly so that Pike, uh, Kirk's personality can be part of the leadership of Starfleet. But if he puts him on this super risky away mission, it's like sink or swim, buddy. If you oh, die, gosh. well, <laughs> I got 10 other cadets in the in waiting who are just like you. Interesting. So maybe you're saying Pike's command strategy is to send people on dangerous <laughs> away missions. And then the ones that survive have this like glory story and they have lives in the ranks. Mm. Actually, okay. Not, not joke. It's kind of true, right? You send, right. you send lieutenants on tasks to like go capture this thing. And then if they succeed, then they climb up the ranks. But you're not you're not going to send an admiral to go do that. Like, no, 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 you're precious. You do command stuff. Stay mm-hmm. home or not home. Stay at base. Right. And if since they can get through the difficult mission, you almost are guaranteed that they got the right stuff. Right. Some and people would die. Some people won't make it. They may have been made good commanders, but the people who made it probably have the right stuff. That's right. Okay. So, so this is test. this is Pike's master strategy of how he commands. Mm-hmm. Okay, but why does he send? Okay, why does he pull Sulu though? Sulu is part of the helmsman team. Now they're going to be down a rotation. That's right. Because if Sulu is yeah, if Sulu is injured, then there's there's got to be other pilots, right? Because Sulu can't be awake all the time, right? Right. So, but if he if there's say there's three, so that way each person gets an eight hour shift. Then mm-hmm. if Sulu gets injured, can't pilot or dies, and therefore can't pilot, then the yep. other two people have to take twelve hour shifts. Like who knows what the situation's gonna be after this. So really you wanna keep your helmsman around so that they can fly the ship away if you need to. Right, so that doesn't seem to make sense. And then engineer Olsen, I don't know, he's an engineer. He's gotta be important yeah. for engineering in some engineering. sense. <laughs> he's just like an angry guy. He's like an angry, he's like ready to go kill people. Right. I mean, maybe he's got in the wrong, the wrong job. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, he's like, he was signed up for Starfleet to do hand-to-hand combat, but like, you're pretty good at math. It's like, Mm. an engineer damn it <laughs> yeah, go... wait, wait, wait. but they have security teams shouldn't the security guys go in this type of thing this type of mission it just doesn't seem to be how starfleet operates they send people from the bridge crew and other places <laughs> on away teams they don't seem to they don't have, seem to have specialized drop teams or away teams or exploration teams who are trained and honed in They're, they send the bridge crew i don't know why but that's how they operate so the most important thing you can do for your Starfleet career is get on the bridge. Do it. Do it. Get on the get bridge on the somehow. Bridge. Get on the bridge. Yeah, chosen for all the cool missions. Don't be under decks. Don't be below decks. Low, low, lower decks, right? That's for that one cartoon show. <laughs> That's right. Dang it. That's right. <laughs> the lower decks guys get passed over all the time. Get on, over get all on the time. deck. Get on the bridge. Get on the bridge. Yeah. Why, why aren't the security guys? That... Okay, but think. imagine the Star Trek universe where they did have drop troopers. Like we're like, we're a science, we're an exploration, we want everyone in the Federation, but we also have orbital drop shock troopers. Oh, like, why do you yeah. need that? Why do you need that Starfleet? Like, what, are you, what, are you, what, what are you doing when okay, you need to drop troopers down? But they do have dedicated security teams. They have security people. Now they may not be training for dropping like this, right. but they certainly train boarding and combat. Gosh. Right? What else could they okay. be doing? So, so I think we're drawing a line between defense and assault. Like it's okay for Starfleet to have defense security because we don't want mm-hmm. people to board your ship. But you don't want. But it, it's a bad look to have assault teams that are like designed for aggression. But that being said, like sometimes, if I would imagine that if you're if you have security people that are trained in defending your ship, they are also cross trained in assaulting a ship, right? That's right. Like, in fact, sometimes the best defense is an offense. I mean, that's a ridiculous saying sometimes, but, no, but it's right. it's I think right. it's true. Like if you know the only way to stop an attack is to attack first, that's a valid strategy. Or heck, heck, if you're if your enemy ships say like Klingon ships, they have they have these incredible weapons and zero defense. Like, do you just stay there and just take the hit in your shields? You'd be like, hey, uh, we're going to send a single photon torpedo and take you out. Like right. sometimes the offense is the right defense. 
Right. So, but they don't have dedicated teams. Or they do kind of have a dedicated team, but they don't send security people on these missions most well, of the time. The security people aren't on the bridge. <laughs> I mean, there's like, there's one guy. There's one, the, the head of security is on the bridge most of the time. You see, oh, who's the head of security right. on the Enterprise here? It's not even, we don't even know. Because the bridge them. crew is Uhura for communications. Yeah. Yeah. Then we've got Sulu, helmsman, Helm. Pike, captain, Kirk, uh-huh. who knows what. First officer, Kirk maybe. Is junior captain. Yeah, he's going to get there. Spock <laughs> is science. Spock is science. Chekhov is Engineering. helmsman, helmsman two. Helmsman comms, internal internal comms, something like that. But I, I don't think we're. Int- There's a bunch of other people on the bridge, but we don't know who the security officer is. Did the original series have a security officer? So, so T- TNG is is Worf. Worf second, but first before that it was uh, Tasha it was Yar. Tasha Yar, thank you. Yeah, and but then, you, they were dedicated security. They got they were at that elevated station, right? And there was a dedicated team for security. It, Voyager was Tuvok. Mm-hmm. So I guess does did the original series have security? I don't know because I don't know. I don't remember. I'm hmm. gonna watch. I don't know. Okay, go back and watch. Tell us in the comments. I don't. I don't yeah. remember. And then, okay, why did he? Why did Pike promote Kirk? I get he's trying to fast track him up the ranks because he knows that person. He wants that personality and the leadership. Uh, but isn't this too soon? Kirk, I'm promoting you to first officer. What, Captain? Please, I apologize. The complexities of human pranks escape me. It's not a prank, Spock, and I'm not the captain. You are. So it doesn't make sense to me. Okay, imagine you're a member of the crew and you've been on the Enterprise or on other ships for a while. You're, you're, you're ambitious. You want to get to the top. And then you're like, who, the, who is this guy? I was in line for the promotion. <laughs> That's right. Who's this? Who's this kid to, oh, first officer. Oh, wait, oh. wait. Wait, first officer. Wait, ca- wait. Cadet, lieutenant, lieutenant commander, commander, first officer, captain. So, so Kirk skips all of that. So actually, I don't think is first officer a rank though. I think first officer. And, oh, I see it's saying. a little confusing. First officer and captain, I don't think are ranks. I think they are positions on a ship. So you can be captain so of a ca- ship ca- without ca- captain's got to be rank. Captain is a rank, but also captain of the ship. So a lieutenant could be a captain of the ship. That's right. Uh, okay, so that's a little confusing, but it's still like if I'm. A lieutenant commander on the ship i've been diligently working at my post mm-hmm, for years mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then talking with so, my manager figuring out what's the next step and so i can advance my career having those yeah. uncomfortable conversations yep every six months I'm yep on time doing my training doing everything mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then going the extra. this rule breaker annoying kid comes in yeah, yeah. and just takes my Does, spot what doesn't even know the layout of the ship doesn't know how things operates mm-hmm. i think at this point he hasn't even had a meal in the ship doesn't even know the mess hall I mean, yeah so I, I as my, as that officer, I'd like know my competition. It's like, oh, you know, Bill got it. I understand that he was also qualified. Mm-hmm. But now all of us are upset at who's Kirk. Like, who who who, the, who is this guy? Who is this guy? Right. Yeah, Kirk hasn't even been on the ship long enough to see how the ship operates. That's right. He doesn't even know the personnel. He doesn't know. Nope. 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 It's doesn't wild. Abilities. Wild. Yeah. Hard fast tracked. Hard, hard. I mean, this is the hardest of the hardest fast track. <laughs> I studied your dad when I was in the academy, and I liked him, so I therefore like you. So you're come on up, your first officer, first officer, first officer, straight to the top, straight to the top. <laughs> yeah, weird, but weird. oh, it worked out. So, a critical part of this movie is the red matter. So, this red matter that gets dropped into various places to make black holes. Um, but what is it? What is it? Prepare the red matter. Yes, sir. Okay, so this ball that like, floats. Yep. Very tense. And it, it like doesn't interact with matter. Like it avoids the needle. Mm-hmm. And then like, it floats on its own. Mm-hmm. Gravitational sensors are off the scale. They're creating a singularity. They're creating a black hole at the center of Vulcan? Yes, sir. How long does the planet have? Minutes, sir. Minutes. My 
my god. Oh, super cool. Yeah. The black hole eats the planet. Whew, it's gone. All those Silence. lives. Silence and a black dot in space. So my question is, what what is this? So it's making a black hole. Mm -hmm. And so it's this red fluid somehow that that makes a black hole. And I guess what is a black hole? It's it's yes, they come from supernovae. So when a star collapses and there's just so much mass into a small area, uh, then it then gets a black hole. Um, but actually, you can make a black hole kind of with anything. You just need to compress it down to a Schwarzschild radius to a to mm -hmm. a, a mass. Uh, you make take any. You can take any. Here we go. You can take a chocolate bar and make a black <laughs> hole if you compress it down to a small enough size. So um, I think so, I think for the Earth, the Schwarzschild radius is three centimeters. So take all of the mass of the Earth and crush it down to three centimeters. Here's one. So three yeah. centimeters, and then yeah, that'll make a black hole. Yeah, don't don't quote so, me on that, but it is absurdly small. Something like, like that. that. Yeah, you really don't. Yeah. You got to crush a lot of mass. Yeah, and so so that's my guess for what red matter is. It's a mass generator it's a mass creator you somehow drop it into place and then it creates mass and then the thing collapses so maybe it couples to the higgs boson something something i'm not high so, energy, high energy okay, okay 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 so that's a good idea so somehow in the containment field where it's in that big huge red ball on the ship mm -hmm. it's somehow let's i'm getting rolling with it it's somehow suppressing it's emitting it's a heavy Gib, uh, Higgs boson emitter, but the containment field somehow stops it from doing that. But when it's released into the planet, it emits so many Higgs bosons that the mass of the planet shoots up real quick, which causes a quick collapse. Right. Causes uh, this big gravitational anomaly because you've just, you've just created mass and mm -hmm. then collapse, I guess. Which means not only is the tech for the red matter super advanced because somehow they just... In the future, they figured out how to manufacture it, or mm -hmm. or just they discovered it. But the containment fluid itself is also super advanced, because okay. somehow that's stopping this chain reaction. Yeah, exactly right. It's somehow making this thing inert and independent by itself. But then, once you drop it in and it comes contact with the planet, yeah, then chain reaction generating mass mm -hmm. black hole. So that fluid must have some really really special properties exotic to be able to contain this like wildly powerful oh. material you mean the fluid like this this clear liquid yeah 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 ah oh, yeah yeah cuz without the clear liquid the red matter is useless cuz you can't store it right it'll just touch the walls of your container and then start the chain reaction and start the chain reaction so but somehow they've alongside the red matter they've also got the red mat the anti red matter i guess which is clear it, matter it's not anti-red matter. It's a, a it's red matter neutral. nullifier. Yeah, there you go. That's even yeah. better. Because it's not so, anti. It's not destroying it. Right. It's just making it not do the thing. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, this is this is a real thing, right? With weapons and explosives and stuff, mm -hmm. you want them to go bang when you want them to go bang, but you also need them to not go bang when you don't want them to go bang. So storage. Bang, bang, no. Not bang, not bang. Right. And actually, you like on ships and in storage things can go off when you don't want them to and that's bad so you mm -hmm. want it to be like hyper inert when you don't want it to go bang and then like truly explosive when you turn hit, hit the switch so red matter super overpowered but they also have the storage technology amazing under underrated underrated we always talk about the red matter but what about that transparent matter what about that transparent totally underrated yeah cool look ship much, though look how much it's containing my god yeah so much you could destroy an entire alpha quadrant with this you take yeah. a little tiny drop and destroy a planet mm -hmm. why why this is so much what is the vulcan academy doing my Just god make a little bit send the ship for a little bit i Weird. mean you have a storage facility for it and if you only need a couple drops the ship should only have a couple drops good point yeah or maybe if, okay <laughs> gosh what if what if spock's <laughs> ship gets stolen you don't want to be releasing all this red matter out into unknown hands mm. <laughs> such as this <laughs> That's right. Oh my God. That's a mistake. That's a big mistake. Cool ship though. Super cool ship. Well, this is the drill drop. Let's look at the operations. Good luck. Ah, oh, so cool. So cool. They're not even trained. They're just winging this. This is amazing. 
Down they go. They're just, they're just no wing. They don't even have wings. They parachute only. <laughs> yeah, so I wonder, like, are, are all the cadets trained on this? Are they just... just right? No way. This is such a difficult operation. And such a rare operation. Why, why would you train your cadets? Be like, if you ever have to ODST, to you. <laughs> you ever have to <laughs> I know, right? Drop, high altitude, wait, high altitude, low opening. If you ever have to do that, like, yeah. get ready. Also, does the physics of this make sense? Because if you're in orbit, then you're moving at orbital speed, which means as soon as you start entering the atmosphere, you're going to burn up. But it looks like they just oh. drop. They're not actually in orbit. Do we know the mass? Do we know what the atmosphere is like for Vulcan? Because I, I can imagine if, it, if the atmosphere is really thin, then would you get enough friction to burn up? I mean, on Earth, you start to burn up really, really high up there. Oh, there, so the atmosphere the at is thick. Okay, I, I got to flip it. If the atmosphere is really thick, would you burn up? I think that just means you burn up at a higher altitude. But where the, I guess you start burning up when the, where the atmosphere is like way thin compared to the surface of the earth, I think. And so thick well, atmosphere, I guess, thin I guess atmosphere. the key thing is, like, I guess the key thing is your, your speed relative to the gas density, because you need, what is the burning up? It's gas is hitting you and depositing kinetic energy into you and then you're getting overheated. That's right. So if you're moving at orbital speed, the gas density that, that causes burn up mm -hmm. is actually fairly low. Very thin. I see. I see. Um, but they do go far enough into the atmosphere that they can breathe when they're on the platform. So they definitely transitioned to a thick enough atmosphere. They should have burnt up somewhere here. Which I think means they're actually not in orbit. They're just sitting there. They're actually not in orbit. They're just sitting above the planet. Um, and it's probably not geostationary orbit because that would be just this narrow window of orbits. I but think it I, means they just have the tech to hover. Sorry, sorry. So there's too many groups of people here because I think the drill is in geosynchronous orbit. Otherwise, this thing would be getting dragged across the surface, right? Like it, it's it, it's pointing at one spot. So I think if it's not connected to the ground, you're going to get the orbital speed at the bottom of the drill is different than the orbital speed at the top of the drill. That's true. And I think you get problems. Also, I think orbital, uh, was it geosynchronous orbit on Earth is like 20,000 kilometers up or something absurd. Okay. I don't think the drill is that long. If assuming Vulcan is Earth-ish. I have no idea. So assuming it's Earth-ish, I don't think the drill is 20,000 kilometers long. So I think the... I think they're just hovering and they're like, they're like using thrusters to, to stay above they, they meaning the, the drill planet. I think everybody or, or in this situation, ship, everyone, okay. everyone, enterprise, the shuttle, the, the mining ship, they're hovering above Vulcan and using okay. thrusters to hold against gravity. Hmm. Right. Otherwise they'd burn up. Otherwise this drill would have kind of weird movements, weird wobbly stuff instead of it's it's just nice and straight, nice and and it can just hold itself under tension, meaning it's just dropping mm. straight down. Hmm. Hmm. So they're not in orbit. They're just hovering. I think it has to be the conclusion. I guess That'll... I'm okay with that as long as the ships can do it. Sure. Sure. I think I think they can, right? They have so much technology. Why not? Yeah, I mean, if, yeah, I mean, they can fly these gigantic ships off the ground. Like they, they've got some technology, yeah. I guess. And I guess that also explains why they didn't burn up because they're truly just dropping from zero mm. speed and they speed up to maybe they don't have all this like tangential velocity. Yeah. They just, yeah, they're, they're above and they just fall. Yeah. I guess if you fall slowly enough, then you don't burn up. I guess what would you, you would hit terminal velocity at for whatever density you're talking about and never reach a sufficient velocity to burn up is that true it Could really you... comes down to the details i guess I'm, I'm guessing gosh we could do a calculation for this you could create some realistic atmospheric pressure drop off could you pick mm -hmm. up enough speed through the low density regions to burn up in the in the lower regions where it's higher pressure my instincts wants to say no but i don't know you're saying you're saying that you would you're saying that in you wouldn't be able to have enough speed 
to travel in the high density gas and get so much friction that you burn up, you're saying that the drag would be large enough that you wouldn't get that fast. I think like so. You'd reach terminal velocity. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe do <laughs> calculations. Maybe some different drop heights. Figure it out. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. We could. I mean, not right now, but <laughs> maybe right. Maybe on SS Science. Oh, good point. Yeah, that's right. And then the drill is taken out by small arms. Does that make sense? So Kirk and Sulu are not really aiming at anything in particular, but they're able to disable the drill. Does that make sense? They're just like vaguely shooting you here. They hit a hose, but otherwise, I mean, yeah, nothing special, nothing clearly soft. I don't know, because on one hand, you would think that this is pretty rugged, mm -hmm. like pretty heavy duty stuff. And these are just rifles, maybe SMGs. I, I don't know, some mm -hmm. type of laser or something. And so should they be able to penetrate this? My guess would be no. On the other hand, it's a mining ship. Like it's not right. designed for combat. So that's right. I don't so know. If it's not, yeah, it's not armored or anything. So if we were to go to like an oil drilling platform on earth mm -hmm. and start firing just a pistol around, it would, it could end in a bad time. Right. There are probably parts that depending on the pistol, the, the mm -hmm. bullet caliber, there's probably parts that you could shoot and be fine. Right. Because depending on whatever the oil pressures are, maybe they need to have mm -hmm. things that are strong enough anyway. Um, but also there certainly could be parts where you shoot it and then things go bad. Mm -hmm. And if I wanted to destroy it, and I know nothing about oil drilling platforms, if I would just like try to seek out important looking things, <laughs> I think I could yeah. do some serious damage. Yeah, so, you get a hunch for what's yeah. important. Yeah. So may maybe this makes sense. They're like aiming for some tubes and some stuff that looks important and... Take it out. But there's so many things that could have, like these things, if I remember, are vents. Yeah. Like who knows reason. where that goes? Like you could have shot right. that. That could have messed up some of them. You could take out but, a wire, then the thing all goes all tippy. And yeah. Lots of things. It, lots of things are going to go bad here, actually. I guess, but you're not going to, it's these like girders that hold the, the drill these platform things. up. Like I'm not going to shoot those because no they way. look yeah, yeah. big and strong and metal like. I'm not going to do big any damage. Big and beefy. I put a little hole here. There's enough mass there to keep it together. That's all right. Yeah. So. I'm okay with it because it's not it's not a military thing. It's not armored. Definitely would have been better with charges, with like explosive Definitely. charges that Olsen, Olsen had. Olsen. Don't send adrenaline junkies on your missions. Seriously. So this is after Kirk and Sulu fall off the platform and Sulu's shoot breaks and Kirk has to rescue Sulu by like hugging him and pulling his shoot and then his shoot breaks. Like what is going on with Starfleet? Okay, wait, why is that a big deal? What do you mean? Oh, I mean, so Kirk is probably what 180 pounds. He's not sure. He's just yeah, yeah, yeah. A, you know a yeah. fully grown man, but nothing crazy. Yeah. And so Sulu is similar size. So they're two fully yeah. grown men, maybe 300, 400 pounds total. Okay. And the shoot is designed with such tight margins that it can't handle two men. Oh. This is crazy. Like oh, that needs to be well with. Two people. So, so, so they they were three. We're estimating that they're like three hundred sixty something pounds, right? Yeah. But it really should be designed for five hundred. Is what you're saying? I'm it, saying it should even, be designed to handle it and like it just be strong and not break away. Right. So, a, a largest person I could think of in Starfleet maybe three hundo. And two I mean, three people, hundo. Right? But they also have non-human. That's people, right. right? Non-human personnel. Right. So it should mm -hmm. be made for the largest non-human personnel that could be on a ship. Hmm. Let's say that's 500 pounds. So you need two of those to be able to be handled, which would be a thousand pounds. And then you should probably just double that for safety. So at least a ton. I see. It should so be able to handle it. You're saying is Starfleet okay because they're designing their safety equipment with like real slim margins. Right. I mean, like it's, it's lowest like, like, bidder, penny pincher stuff. What is going on? It's like my, my drive to work every day is 10 miles. So I'm going to get a gas tank that's 10.2 miles. Like, what are you doing? Like, just engineer up, engineer up 15 miles. Give you a little bit of buffer space. Buffer space, yeah. Especially this and is a this is a emergency situation, and it's not completely mm -hmm. unforeseen. This is well, how I mean, it, it's 
this is what we have now, right? There are right. stories where people were like, my my main shoot failed, my emergency shoot failed, and then some other skydiver was like, I got you, they like got dive you. down, like grab a hug of life, like pull my shoot, like this actually happens. Right. So the shoots have to be engineered to handle those situations. And this shoot is so, so thin, so measly that it breaks. Mm -hmm. I guess my, my only caveat to that is that because there's all this downward momentum, and then the chute opens and applies upward force. It's you need you need much more than just the person's weight. Person's weight is if they're like at a at a steady slow fall, right? But mm -hmm. the actual the actual impulse is enormous. But uh, is, but that being said, that being that being said, you just engineer for that. Like yeah. you just scale, right? you just scale think, up your your tolerance. Yeah, and I think shoots are designed not to like do this like bam unfurl. I think they're designed to like open up open up slowly. slowly so it's not this like bam on the cords mm -hmm. i mean also bam on the person right so well i know from rock climbing there are static ropes and there are dynamic ropes static right. ropes are like you pull tight oh, oh gosh you pull yeah well there was an example you yeah. pull tight and if you pull with too much force it's it's rigid or rock hard and you'll right. if you fall with a with a static rope you'll you'll break mm -hmm. your spine and so there's these dynamic ropes which mm -hmm. are strong but they're also like stretchy springy so that way, if you fall off a, off a rock face, you have a bit of distance where the rope will stretch and slow right. you down gently uh, as opposed to bringing your back. So in summary, the Starfleet parachute people need to go back to the drawing board and really rethink their equipment because this is this is awful. This is this is engineered to just exactly the limits and then break away. I mean, it's to the point where I wouldn't even trust it myself. That's right. Next time I'm just... I'm taking a transporter down. Yeah, yeah, seriously. Okay, this scene is where Spock's mom dies. And I noticed something. I've watched this movie several times. I noticed something this time that I'd never noticed before. Transporter in five, four, three, two. I'm losing her. I'm losing her. I'm losing her. No, I'm... Oof, brutal. Right here. I didn't see it. What did you see? First of all, heavy. First of all, like you're looking at your mom and then you're suddenly on the starship. And you're like, she's gone. No mom. Like, ah, ah, I feel it. Okay. So, so we see, we see on the planet Vulcan, his mom is starting to get transported. Yep. But then she slips away when yep. the rock face slips away. Yep. And so she doesn't arrive on the ship, but she almost does. Mm -hmm. So this, this is actually Spock's mom. And we see it because, yeah, it's just blurry or whatever, right? We see it because this is when Spock starts to form back here. Oh. So here it keeps right. going. His, his, his whirly gets stronger. And then the mom, you can even almost, you can even almost see her face. The mom, the mom disappears. Yeah, there's definitely two bodies coalescing and then one fades away. Right? I've never noticed this before. Yeah, so yeah, the mom's forming, forming, almost there, almost there, and then signal lost. Right, from our perspective, I never noticed that before because it just looks like Spock's, Spock showed up. Spock showed up, but actually there's two there. Okay, and now I've noticed this just now. You can you start to see her face forming. Oh, really? Right there, oh, right yeah. there. Right? There it is. Here's, here's her nose, eyes, eyes, mouth. Oh, I mean, this is like literal, like a second <sighs> difference it's it's ghostly it's it's and oh, life heebie-jeebies oh my gosh i mean light like, super cool detail but yeah brutal. sometimes life is a game of inches and seconds damn yeah brutal brutal cool detail very yeah, cool really? for the film but brutal for brutal for my <laughs> emotions yeah yeah seriously Okay, so then after after Spock's mother dies, he's he's like struggling with it, and, and he's fighting some battles. And Uhura comes and comforts her, and this this is this is a this is a good woman. We protect her. This is this is good. This scene gets me. I'm sorry. So she's comforting him, and and. Physical touch is her love language, so she's like trying to give it to him, and what do you he's trying to give it to him. And at first, he's he's like he's in shock. His mother just died. His planet just just got destroyed into a black hole, and he's he's like 
blank. He's like autopiloting. He's 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 in shock, and, and so she hugs him, and then he gets he he caves in, and he like cr- he craves he he caves in he he receives that affection for Amir, and 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 he goes in for it because he needs it. Let's get more. Okay. What do you need? Tell me. She asks him like, "What do you need?" Like she wants to help him, but. It's Spock. He's very. It's hard, it's hard to read him. He's a very emotion. He's, he's Vulcan shut down emotions. So she's like, "Tell me what you need." And she wants. She wants to help him. And, and he's in a tough situation. Let, let's see what his answer is. Tell me. I need everyone to continue performing admirably. He says. He says, "I need everyone to continue performing admirably." So he's. His mother just died. His planet was just destroyed, and and he's, I mean, he's in shock. He, his emotions are just 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 all over the place. I mean, I mean, just damaged absolutely. But at the same time, he's he he's Spock. He's half Vulcan, and and he's been raised, and and he internalizes all the time, like shut down the feelings, shut down the feelings, logical, logical, logical type. But not only that, he's now the captain of the ship, so it's 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 extra not the time for him to be feeling anything, going off in emotional problems. So he's so he he buttons up, he tightens up, and he says, "I just need everyone to continue performing admirably." And Uhura, I mean, he's basically saying, "Leave me alone, right? Leave me alone. Go back to work." And Uhura reads it, and it's not really what she wanted to do. She wanted to help him, but you can see you can see how she's processing it, and she says, "That's what he needs. It doesn't feel good for me, but that's what he needs. I'm going to do it." One little kiss. I care about you. Back to it. Heavy scene. Oh, fantastic yeah. acting. Fantastic. Yeah. Brutal. Brutal scene. Mm. But also a super good scene. Super good scene because it's nice to see Spock have that type of relationship. That's true. It to- totally is, yeah. On the other hand, this is a wildly inappropriate bridge relationship. <laughs> I mean, two people on the bridge crew in a romantic relationship got to get in the game. They're like over in the corner supporting each other emotionally. Like, uh... Yeah. People like yeah. the shit. Okay, eat, eat. Okay, okay, I guess I see what you're saying. So even <laughs> even if they weren't in this dire situation, you shouldn't have bridge crew dating each other and like helping the captain make decisions because they're gonna be biased. That's right. Yeah. And who who has more influence over the captain right now? The first officer, whoever the hell that is, or Uhura. 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 Which that's not her place. Inappropriate. Inappropriate. I mean, okay. Touching. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> but this yeah. is an inter- <laughs> jerk. I said something nice. <laughs> okay, no, she did everything saying. right to support her significant other. Yeah. I don't actually yeah. don't. There's boyfriend, significant other. Somehow, super serious. Yeah. I'm not sure, somehow, but somehow, she supported somehow. him. Great. <laughs> but inappropriate. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. It's inappropriate. I mean, if you're in battle, let's say you're in like heavy combat, people get losing people all the time. Everybody has to sort of be in the game right? and continue to operate, function admirably. If they're all like, these two people are in a relationship supporting each other in the corner and those two people are having a fight right now. Like this is... <laughs> <laughs> like, like an active fight. Okay, I think this is actually true. Like this is something in the military where if you, you're not allowed to serve in the same group or something as your significant other. Is that right? Yeah. I wonder how it, how it happens in real situations where, you know, you put people in the same room, stuff happens sometimes. Stuff I wonder happens. how yeah, yeah, yeah. people fall in love. They deal with it, yeah. Jerk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is McCoy, and his, his line is always, I'm a doctor, not a physicist. Like, even back from the original series. Super fun. Super fun. Um, mm-hmm. from, like, this is cool. Okay, but he actually, like, maybe he should be a physicist. 
And where did the Romulans get that kind of weight? The engineering comprehension necessary to artificially create a black hole may suggest an answer. Such technology could theoretically be manipulated to create a tunnel through space-time. Damn it, okay. man, I'm a doctor, not a physicist. Are you actually suggesting they're from the future? If you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. He's like, I'm a doctor, not a physicist, but then he, he listens to Spock, understands everything, and interprets it out in his, in his own words, and he's exactly right. But not only that, he interpreted the more complicated statement into his own words, and he simplified it down to the important essence for the situation at hand. So he really understands it. Yeah, like maybe, maybe he should be a physicist. Because the ability to take something complex and distill it down to something simple for relevant for the situation requires mm -hmm. a level of expertise that he's saying he doesn't have. That's right, a level of expertise where you can identify what's important, keep it. What's not important, throw it away. And so he distills the idea down to just the core stuff. Gosh, I see this when I'm teaching all the time, teaching physics, mm -hmm. and st teach students to draw a picture. Mm -hmm. This is actually a tremendously difficult skill because you have to draw exactly what's relevant and nothing more. Because anything mm -hmm. else is just clutter that takes away from the understanding. But if you don't draw enough, it's oversimplified to get the wrong answer. So drawing mm -hmm. a picture that's simple but complex enough and dialed in for what you need to know is actually a big skill difficult skill yeah, to learn and often students put no detail or they put too much detail it's hard to dial that in the fact that right. he's able to do it verbally instead verbally of and on the fly in 10 situation Ooh. wow okay but my fun thing <laughs> my fun thing is is he says i'm a doctor not a physicist and I am a physicist, but I'm not a doctor. So I'll go around and I'll, I'll, switch, I'll swap around. Like I'm a doc, I'm a physicist, not a doctor. And so, so like I'll see someone, so I see someone like falls down on their bicycle and it's like, are they injured? And they're, they're like, oh, my hand. I'm like, I'm a physicist, not a doctor. Like, don't ask me. But then you quickly repair their arm. With, with physics. With physics. No, with a doctor. <laughs> like I am a doctor. Also do this with like, like somebody chipped their tooth at work. And then I was like, is his tooth chipped? I don't know. I'm a physicist, not a dentist. Ah, uh, yeah. One time my cat was sick and I was like, I have no idea what's going on. I'm a physicist, not a doctor or vet. Not a, not a vet. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. 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 So I was, I was, I was doing a neighborhood, one of the evening walks with, with my, with my lady friend and, and there was this dog that was like, bark, 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 bark. Right. And I was like, I was like, Ooh, puppy. I like, walked up to him and she's like, no, stop. Like not friendly. Right. And I was like, I'm a physicist, not a animal mental transfer psychologist. Like I can't psychic. I'm not an animal psychic. It's like, but like, clearly the dog's like, bark, 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 bark. like, okay. This is an interesting scene because I agree with Spock. I agree with Spock. Kirk wants to take on Nero, but I feel like he has no plan and Spock is making sense. What we need to do is catch up to that ship. Disable it, take it over, and get Pike back. We are technologically outmatched in every way. A rescue attempt would be illogical. Nero's ship would have to drop out of warp for us to overtake. Well, then what Good about point. assigning point. engineering crews to try and boost our warp yield? Remaining power and crew are being used to repair okay. radiation leaks in the lower decks okay. and damage right. prudence. Right. communications without There's which we got cannot to be contact some way. Starfleet. We must gather with the rest of Starfleet to balance the terms of the next engagement. There won't I be agree. a next engagement. By the time we've gathered, it'll be too late. But you say agree. he's from the future, knows what's gonna happen, then the logical thing is to be unpredictable. You are assuming that Nero knows how events are predicted to unfold. The contrary, Nero's very presence has altered the flow of history, beginning with the attack on the USS Kelvin, culminating in the events of today, thereby creating an entire new chain of incidents that cannot be anticipated by either party. An alternate yep. reality. Precisely. Whatever oh, yeah. our lives might have been if the Hurrah. time continuum was disrupted, our destinies have changed. Mr. Sulu, plot a course to the Laurentian system, warp factor three. Spock, don't do that. Running back to the rest of the fleet for a, a, a confab is a massive waste of time. These are the orders issued by Captain Pike when he left He also ship. ordered us to go back and get him. Spock, you are captain now. You I have to make I am aware of my responsibilities, Mr. Every Pike. second we waste, Nero's getting closer to his next target. That is correct, and why I'm instructing you to accept the fact that I, I will alone not allow us to go command. backwards. Jim, I'm come on, from him instead of hunting Nero down. Security, escort him out. I mean... For everything that Kirk said, Spock had a solid reason to not do it. And okay. Kirk is running around yelling, like, we need to go forward. But, like, you are going against a ship from the future that was able to destroy, I don't know, 10, 20 ships mm -hmm. at once without taking any damage. 
and you're one ship that you can't catch up to the mining ship and you want to take it on and destroy it like i'm all for taking on the ship and destroying it but how you can't just like emotion your way into <laughs> <laughs> to like destroying See, but, the ship but but emotionally i do agree with kirk like we gotta we gotta do something like, the ship is going towards earth and if it arrives at earth mm -hmm. not only is human or humans messed up but the federation mm -hmm. as a whole is messed up right so like i like i agree like i I, I want to do something. I want to chase after Nero. Mm -hmm. But, okay, so you want to take out Nero. So then the question becomes, yeah. what's the best course of action? Is the best course of action to try and take on a ship that clearly outmatches you without anything up your sleeve? Cle or clearly, to... outmatches, clearly outmatches you that you can't catch up to and you can't get on. Right. So, or is it better to go meet with the fleet and try to outnumber the ship and take it out. I think that makes more sense. Try to outnumber the ship. That's your. I agree. Like, if if Nero wants to take out Earth, say, and we want to stop him in the Enterprise, I don't think we can. Yeah, it's like a fly going up against an elephant. It's just, the elephant doesn't even care. Like whatever. That's right. So the elephant doesn't care, and so mm -hmm. in fact, you diminish the fleet. So you make the That's chances right. of taking Nero out less by doing some hero move that is entire, it almost is certainly going to fail. But it feels good, but it's almost certainly going to fail. In fact, I mean, the only reason it doesn't fail is because they find the, um, the engineer on the ice planet, right? Yeah, Scotty. They find so Scotty. Scotty he they has find the Scotty on the ice planet. And he has the equation that can, that can teleport you on the ship in, in, in warp speed. It's even worse than that because Scotty hadn't invented it yet. It was Spock time traveling from the future that gave him That's right. the transwarp equation, which is the twist they needed to make the plan work. But they don't have that here. He's got hope and a prayer. Yeah. So while yeah. emotionally I agree with Kirk, but if you if I have an enemy that's taken me out and I want to stop him, I got to think about what's the best way to do that. I can't just be like, I'm going to attack, charge, and then we all get slaughtered. Like that's not good. <laughs> right if your entire team dies they can't they can't win if everyone's dead right mm. and he calls the the meeting a confab like it's some sort of like committee meeting that's gonna no no this is a com this is a wait, wait a that confab? auto completed confab an informal private conversation discussion Engage in informal private conversation. Oh, yeah, we're going to have a private conversation somewhere here in the Lorenzine system. I see it. No, no, no. They were going to, we're going to go meet to join up with the fleet to do combat. This isn't a confab. That's right. So I don't know what Kirk is talking about. Yeah, I guess that's what, <laughs> I guess, yeah, I guess that's the point of what Spock did, I guess. It's, you need, you get a leap before looking plus uh let's be cautious and think things through and the, the the two of them together is actually what makes a good captain i mean sort of because like if i'm on the bridge crew right now kirk rolls into the bridge and is like <laughs> yelling at people this is stupid what are you doing confab like and, he, and he's we... just like this illogical thing this illogical <laughs> thing this one and you're like i i don't want to follow you right and and i actually kind of agree with spock why are you yelling yeah. let's Let's dial it down and make the right decision. Please leave. <laughs> Please leave. I don't want to die today. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would die. I would sacrifice my life if I had a high chance of taking out Nero's ship. But I don't want to sacrifice myself if I'm just doing it because it makes me feel better. Like, I want an actual chance to take out Nero. That's right. So I will sacrifice right. myself, but I got to have a chance. Kirk, what are you doing? Kirk, all feels. All feels, no reels. <laughs> okay, so Spock exiles Kirk because of all the yelling down to this planet, this ice planet, and he gets attacked by this red monster. The red monster, it, well, let's watch and then we'll talk about it. <laughs> oh. So the monster you can see in the still right here is all thin and spindly mm -hmm. and he's got membranes in his mouth and he's slobbering all over the place. Mm -hmm. So the slobber represents, it could, that's a lot of evaporative cooling. Okay. The fact that he's long and spindly means there's a lot of surface area to volume. So that's a lot of cooling. 
Mm -hmm. And the fact that he's got membranes, that's a ton of surface area per volume. That's okay. a lot of cooling. So we've got this animal that looks like it's not designed for cold because it's got a lot of <gasps> cooling. Ooh. So that seems weird. Yeah. So you're saying you're saying given this environment, frozen environment, mm -hmm. you would expect this creature to either have a lot of fur yep. or to be blubbery. Yep. Blubbery like like a like a seal or walrus. Yeah. And and they're, round. They're, and roundish. Yeah, the blubbly around and round. So you get a lot of mass for the amount of surface area you have. Yeah. Because and that's yep. that's a good thing because the more the more surface area you have divided by your 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 mass, so the more the more exposed you are to the environment, the more you're gonna leak heat out. So like this real thin section here is just leaking heat out in all sorts of different directions. Yep. Yeah, it looks like this thing shouldn't live here. So I think maybe we can make it make sense if this animal has just a super super high metabolism all the time oh okay which means yeah. he's so got if, access if it, to if it generates wait, 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 wait. explain yeah, yeah, that ahead. so you, if the metabolism if the metabolism is high enough it can generate enough heat through its metabolic process to that it can afford to lose all that heat and still be okay right so the I see. the evolutionary pressure is like get a cool design for hunting don't worry about heat because we've got plenty of energy to expend on metabolism. Our heart rate's super fast, not yeah. a problem. Yeah. I see. So that means this creature has access to food, like lots of it, that is accessible pretty easily. Hmm. Otherwise, cooling would be more of an issue, which means right. it's not going to waste its time chasing down Kirk. It's high effort, low calories. Yeah, there's just not enough food in here to sustain this thing. Right. And yeah, even if true. he does catch Kirk, like he's expended how much energy in the process? That's chasing after it. Not worth it. Which means I think the creature is playing with Kirk. Like he's not actually chasing him to eat him. He's chasing. It's like, oh, creature, let's, let's have some fun. And this is how the animal has fun. Oh, yeah. Okay. I see it. <laughs> I see it. <laughs> yeah. Because the animal's like tumbling down mountains and yelling at Kirk and having fun, just having fun. <laughs> Did he really right. ever make a serious effort to take out Kirk? I didn't see it. Look at those claws. Yeah, this this animal clearly outmatches Kirk. If it wants Kirk, should be no problem. But that's the fact that he doesn't get Kirk means he's playing. He's playing. He's having a good time. And Kirk doesn't recognize it. <laughs> he's like, ah, teeth, you're scary. Run away. Yeah. Run away. And he's like, why is he running away? I'm trying to have fun. Play with me. Play with me. So he's like, Play yeah. with yeah. me. Mm -hmm. So Kirk is the cat that's trying to run under the bed. Mm. And the red this, thing this is, is the human. You notice his head down low, just like a puppy play pose. They put their head and paws yeah, yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's this. It's this. Yeah. Look at his, his claws on his, his uh, forward limbs. I didn't yeah. even see this. They're Hold fully, in. they're fully like put away. He's well, not trying. Here's my, here's my murder mittens. I put them yeah. away. Not put them scared. away. They're not out front looking to slash. They're, they're back here because I don't want to mm -hmm. hurt you. But these pointy teeth are pointed you, towards you. But that's because that's how I talk. I want yep. the sound to go to you. Yeah. It's very windy outside. Yeah. He's playing. He's playing. I see it. <laughs> I see it. You got there through energy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's tight logic. So old Spock rescues young Kirk. And Spock explains to Kirk the situation through a mind meld. I think the explanation is fairly lousy. Let's watch. I promised the Romulans that I would save their planet. We outfitted our fastest ship. Using red matter, I would create a black hole, which would absorb the exploding star. I was en route when the unthinkable happened. The supernova destroyed Romulus. Sorry, I had little time. I had to explain. How did the supernova just kind of sneak up on Romulus? What do you mean? Like, the star exploded. But I mean, we this the timeline of stars is millions, billions of years a lot of the time. Billions, yeah. And even a supernova, which probably is this really fast process, could probably take a couple hundred years. Like it could start showing signs. I see what you're saying. And it happens so rapidly that Romulus was completely unprepared. I just like, so it, oh, whoops. I think I've, oh gosh, I did this calculation years. I don't remember the answer. So, so the, the actual supernova event. So like the mm -hmm. collapse and explosion is very fast, very fast. 
but the build up to supernova event is very slow. Like yeah. for example, for for Earth, we like, we we have this prediction that the sun is going to expand and and envelop the Earth, but it's like billions of years. Like we know it's coming. You have plenty of time. And so the Romulans, like they're 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 no they're no slouches. Like they're they're very technologically smart. They're very scientifically good. So they should know this is coming. So so yeah. how did they get surprised by an explosion? Like they they have ships. They had plenty of time to get everyone off planet. That's right. And also, this has to be the star that their planet is revolving around it can't be a star nearby because that's going to be light years away in I which see. case the shock waves are going to take well okay say it's two year light years away that's the closest star to vulcan or sorry mm, yeah okay. to to uh, romulus yep. then the supernova happens and they have minimum two years if yeah if the if the if the gas of the star is expanding at the speed of light which right which too it's fast not. it's, it's too fast. a conservative estimate right then they would still have two years from the flash to like gas is coming at us. We got two years mm -hmm. to evacuate. Plenty of time. Plenty of time. So I don't think, which means the star in the Romulus system is the one that exploded. But yeah. that means they're so unprepared for this. When they've been watching the star go through its buildup to supernova over time, that they've made no preparations. They're just they've just made no adjustments. They're they, and they they do a last minute hail mary to the Federation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I got. I got. I got a story. So maybe the political structure of Romulus, mm -hmm. they were all supernova deniers. They're like supernova star, oh, no. star status change deniers, and so they're like, like it's not coming. It's not coming. They're like it's here. Vulcans help. Vulcans come. Okay, that is super plausible. <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of deniers in power, and yeah. then oh, it's here. Oh, oh. But like, then okay. Okay, but then how did it sneak up on Spock? He's not a denier, or is, or is he? No, he isn't. He isn't a denier because no, 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 he no, no, has no. the ship. Right. The, so so my only guess to that is that that Romulans have sovereign control over their space. And it's not the place of Vulcans and the Federation to be like, hey, your thing's going on there. Like, watch out. Mm -hmm. It's like, like leave like their, their space. They're sovereign. They do their own thing. Like, we won't interfere until until Romulans are like, hey, come, come and come out. Mm -hmm. I guess. Okay. And then so they, the Federation is throwing together a last minute rescue plan and they fast track it as best they can. And en route, yep. Spock is like, Just it's, hap it. it's happening. I'm, I'm, oh, okay. Man, okay. man, imagine that means that whoever made that phone call from Romulan to, from Romulus <laughs> to, to Vulcan, they like, they missed it by like a couple hours. Like if they had picked up the phone call a couple hours earlier, oh. they would have made it. Yeah, the denial is so hardcore so that it, they have to. Last it's, minute, it's, missed it. Yeah. Oh, missed it. Gosh, that has to be the explanation because otherwise Romulus would take action. Yeah, they have to have such planet. strong denialism in their culture. Damn. Okay, which I guess is plausible because the Romulan culture is very like secretive, backstabby, yeah. and yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Is there more to this? I think there's more. I had little time. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had yeah. to extract the red matter and shoot it into the supernova. Okay, last minute. That makes sense. Last minute. All right. But but an okay plan. Return trip, I was intercepted. He called himself Nero. In my attempt to escape, both of us were pulled into the black hole. Nero went through first. Summer. But what was years for Nero was only seconds for me. I went through the black hole. Nero was waiting for me. Ah, and Nero is one of these hardcore deniers, just filled with emotion ah. all the time. He's just a ah. denier. And as soon as his home's destroyed, he does a full flip to, it's their fault. It's his fault. Ah, uh, yeah. It and, wasn't that the star went supernova on its own. It's, you did it. You made it go supernova. You. It wasn't Romul Romulus's fault. You did it. It had yeah. nothing to do with us. We're in innocent bystanders. You did it. My denial is social media. If I check social media on Romulus, like nobody was saying it was there. It just suddenly <laughs> happened. It just suddenly happened. It's your fault. You didn't take action. And so now he's just attacking the next thing. And then he'll gaslight himself into thinking he was never a denier to begin with and he's an innocent victim. I was there perfect. Is. There it is. Uh. Makes sense. <laughs> Dang. Okay. Still not, not such a great explanation of how it went down. Right. There's a little bit of background information that we're filling yeah, in yeah. that I think 
actually kind of makes sense. Yeah, with the background information, it makes sense. Sure. The denialism on Romulus is hilarious. Strong <laughs> cultural problems. Yeah. Okay, so with that information from, from Spock and Scotty, uh, Kirk hops back on the board and then and then emotionally compromises Spock. Old Spock, new Spock. However, I don't think this should count. Step away from me, what is it like not to feel anger or heartbreak or the need to stop at nothing to avenge the death of the woman who gave birth to you? Back away from you me. feel nothing. You never loved her. Ah! Oof. Oh. Doctor, I am no longer fit for duty. I hereby relinquish my command based on the fact that I have been emotionally compromised. Okay, I like the idea, and I, I think it's right. If the cam captain is emotionally compromised, they cannot be level-headed. They cannot command the ship. Yep. However, does this? I mean, does this count? Like, does, does it count if your one of your subordinates is like? inches from your face and like yelling at you and telling you about how your mom just died like like does it because 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 spock was commanding the ship like quite successfully up until kirk is in his face yep. and yelling and, and spock's even like back away he says it twice he's like back away like mm -hmm. step away from me and kirk is just more and more and more like in your face does that count if you're to be emotionally compromised if you're goaded into it i mean i could see an avenue where if you're on the precipice and somebody goads you into it and you sort of fall apart. Mm. But that's not what happened here. Kirk had to really like get in his push face. Push buttons, right? Like really yeah. get under his skin. It's not like he's talking from 10 feet away like, Mama, and then Kirk, Spock just falls apart. Like that's not what happened. Also, imagine you're a member of the bridge crew. Okay, you're sitting there. Everything's working hunky-dory. Kirk comes in. And is yelling, we need to go. It's a confab. You're not, you need to go forward. And then Spock exiles him and everything's hunky dory again. We're cool. We're, mo we're moving yep, forward. Yep. Ship going Kirk on. Kirk comes back, yelling at Spock again. Spock breaks down. It's like, can we get Kirk out of here, please? We're yeah. running smooth. He runs in. It's chaos. And then Spock resigns. And now Kirk is the captain. We're like, I don't want him here. He just. What is this absolute shoot show of a ship? Like what? Right. What is no no discipline, no order? What is happening here? The guy who comes in with like yelling and emotional volleys, mm -hmm. ruining the camaraderie on the bridge, is now captain. Like and his and his friend is wet. Like why are what? you wet? How did you get Could, wet on the ship? Yeah. And now you're captain. I, and now you're captain. Who is it? Get, please well, leave. Get, get him off of here. <laughs> This fight on the bridge no good yeah i don't no think good. this should count this shouldn't count as it shouldn't compromised. count it shouldn't count i think he is emotionally compromised and he should have recused but, but himself earlier but he is handling it yeah. and in in war which this is now very very combat warlike mm -hmm. everybody's on the edge so you got to pull it together yeah and uh, spock's spock's mind he's still thinking he's mm -hmm. making logical decisions tactically wise tactically safe should be fine yeah, I agree. Oh, so this is Chekhov talking about Saturn's rings. He talks about Saturn's rings using magnetic interference to hide them. I'm not sure I understand. Let's listen. If we drop out of work behind one of Saturn's moons, say Titan, mm. the magnetic distortion from the planet's rings will make us invisible to Nero's sensors. So he's saying the planet's rings have magnetic distortion. But right. I think if we aim telescopes at Saturn, we don't see any magnetic distortion from the rings. I think we can just oh, look at so. the rings. They're, they're effectively we can look, just rocks. They're just rocks. Yeah. So is he saying that he would br they would bring the Enterprise behind the rings and literally just block so. the light? And then that's magnetic interference? Oh, I see what you're saying. So you're saying it's a, so. So Chekhov is like, if we position our ship in the shadow of Saturn's rings, that'll be magnetic. Like it's not magnetic. It's just it's just being in the shadow. But I mean, technically, because light is an electromagnetic wave, and the rock is blocking the light by diminishing the electromagnetic wave, it's essentially some kind of. I mean, 
magnetic interference. I mean, this is really a stretch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay, okay, okay. So, so you're saying light is an electromagnetic mm -hmm. radiation, mm -hmm. light wave. And so anything that messes with a light wave is magnetic. I mean, that means that right, my right? shirt is magnetic yeah, radiation because yeah. you yeah, can't yeah. see my skin. You, you can't see me because of magnetic interference. Like, that doesn't happen. <laughs> that doesn't happen. <laughs> so I wonder, I wonder if, but Chekhov is super smart. Yeah. So I wonder if he, he knows like magnetic interference is like the buzzword is like the right thing to say to get Kirk. Be like, oh, oh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't understand that. So I'm going to trust you. That's right. And we're going to do that. And tactically, tactically, it's right. It worked, right? Right. It worked. So that means Chekhov is able to like read the room and like drop the buzzword that needs to get his point across. Mm -hmm. That's advanced, like reading what? people. What an absolute <laughs> chat. What an, what an absolute hot oh, shot. Hot. Yeah. 17. Damn. He's 17. In fact, he says it here. Ready, ready, yeah. ready. Yep. Yeah. I have projected that Nero will travel past Saturn if we drop out of work behind one of Saturn's moons. The magnetic distortion from the planet's rings will make us invisible to Nero's sensors, and we can beam aboard the enemy ship. Wait a minute, kid. How old are you? 17, sir. Oh, oh good. He's 17. What an absolute hot shot. I mean, I mean he's 17, super young, like even Star Trek universe, super young, but like, he's right, right? Right. Yeah. So okay. He's so he got the stuff. He's not only seventeen, and he's on the bridge, which is amazing in its own right. He's able to play the captain using like buzzwords and social games to get what he thinks is the right move implemented. Mm -hmm. So not only does he have the brains, he's got the social skills. He is top level. Mm hmm. And cardio for days. He like runs around the ship. <laughs> that's right <laughs> he doesn't he doesn't miss a beat when it comes to his cardio training as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. should make him the captain i mean he gets captain eventually right eventually yeah he's 17 he's kind of young he's i get it yeah so this is spock's ship so so kelvin spock young spock encounters the ship from old spock from regular time uh, timeline and uh it's just a super cool ship the design of the ship is far more advanced than I had anticipated. Voice print and face recognition analysis. Welcome back, Ambassador Spock. Oh, that's weird. That's good. Computer. <laughs> I like that. What is your manufacturing origin? Stardate 2387. Commissioned by the Vulcan Science Academy. You're gonna be able to fly this thing, right? Something tells me I already have. Okay. Super cool chair. I want this chair. It does not look comfortable. For Spock's... For Spock's... Super tight, never relaxing posture. Yeah. Look at this cool ship. It has like this so mini cool. guys and like a jet mm -hmm. on the back. Looks like a squid. So yeah, the ship is like is like an entrance, a yeah. cargo bay, and then a tube. A tube that's mm -hmm. like that, that where you walk to the captain's chair. Yeah. And really it, that's it. Like the ship does not need to have lots of stuff. It's just exactly what it needs. Very elegant. And, and even, even where the pilot sh sits, <laughs> even where the pilot sits, it's like out here in front. And yeah, you're going to lose some line of sight to the side of the ship, mm -hmm. but you've shoved the pilot away in the front. They can see a pretty large angle. So you, the pilot probably has very good awareness of what's around them. Yeah, right. So his, his, his cone of vision is pretty, pretty large. Right. So it's kind of cool. Super cool ship. And I guess the cargo bay is built entirely around the red matter mm -hmm. like it's specifically designed to I used to hold something of that size <laughs> but i'm thinking not only that size but probably that specific thing maybe right is that right or do you think this is just a an, any old cargo container and they just put the red matter in there gosh the that, red matter really that's my, that's my hunch because they because old spock said like we've rushed to, we got our ship together or something right. you, you see them doing it so they probably didn't design a ship around it i guess i guess if they did if they did take like like if romulus was like we need help and, and vulcans were like eh, give us like a couple of years to r d a ship like okay if that happened i understand why nero would be angry i figured they just took an old ship whatever ship they had around and then repurposed it and shoved a shoved the red matter in there but that mean that would mean when nero is angry he's like following the development of the rescue mission like 
There's delays because there's a committee meeting about <laughs> you, which you design would have we had should to have go from. That's right. Actually, so if if that's the case, he should be rushing, you know, evacuations. Oh, but he's a denialist. So but then, why is he following the ship design? <laughs> post acto, post acto. Uh, well, maybe he looked it up after it happened. Maybe. I don't know. Okay. Cool ship, though. Cool ship. Weird, like squiddy vibe to it. Yeah. So, okay, this is Nero taking on Kirk in. Gosh, what is the name of the ship? That. Is Nero's uh, ship? There's something. I don't know. Yeah. I don't so know. they're on. They're it's on Nero's, Nero's ship. They're on Nero's ship, and he recognizes Kirk's face. What? I know your face from Earth's history. James T. Kirk was considered to be a great man. He went on to captain the USS Enterprise. So okay. my head cannon for this is, they've been hanging out in this time in this timeline for 25 years. Okay. So they got to occupy their time with something. And Nero has been a, been studying up on his history, like many cultures, recognizing faces, knowing the lore of different cultures. People so that speak. like he knows he knows so much history that he is down to the captain level of the Federation. Like he knows all the leadership, he knows everything top down. He's he's down to the captain level. He's it's been e studying. It's even, it's even it's even better than that. Because because this at this stage, Kirk is still young. Kirk is yeah. just becoming a captain for the first time. He hasn't done his amazing feats that would have mm -hmm. put him into the, the the annals of history, and so so w in which case he would be recorded as as old Kirk. So that means right. Nero knows Kirk's face at different stages of Kirk's life. Like yep. so like he's memorized like oh this is a fifty five year old Kirk. This is a mm -hmm. twenty seven year old Kirk. This is a like, yep. he he has incredible face memory like he's like flipping through pages and memorizing yeah. every and he doesn't know he's going to encounter kirk specifically yep like, so he's just memorizing like every federation captain's face at different stages throughout their life right so that means Vul so what the three founding members are vulcan andoria and earth mm -hmm. so you got to hit all three so he's down to the captain level for at least those three and then there's like hundreds of other planets that have joined since then and they all have members of Starfleet. So he's got to remember all of them too, because he doesn't know he's going to encounter Kirk. So he's mm -hmm. got this huge library of faces and knowledge about the Federation history. I imagine because he's been studying it for 25 years. <laughs> I mean, so actually he's quite the scholar. He's a scholar. For yeah. history. He's held onto that rage, but he's also a scholar. He's also a scholar, yeah. <laughs> and so to end the fight, Spock, young Spock crashes the ship into the Nero ship, but but he crashes. Mm -hmm. He destroys. He actually, he actually destroys both of the ships. And my thought was, does he? Does Spock, as a Starfleet officer, mm -hmm. does he have a duty to preserve to preserve these ships? I think so. Hmm. Boom! Boom! Black hole. So he, Spock sacrifices the ship and, and all the red mm -hmm. matter on the ship. Yeah. So this is this is technology. So so there's two things here. There's technology of the red matter that the Federation could mm -hmm. have used either either weaponized or yep. as a stopping other supernova events, and that information is gone now. Mm -hmm. Also, the ship, the the ship. I I really think that there would be a standing order for all Federation officers to capture any foreign any alien technology and especially true of future technology now now you might worry that oh there's timeline issues like you you don't want technology from the future because then it could you, you could affect the timeline but we're well we're well past that so the timeline has been altered it's been forked it's a completely different timeline in which case this technology is not from your future it's from a future that no longer exists or, or exists but you can't access however you want to think about it and so i think you really should have captured and we should, should have kept both vehicles because who knows who knows what like if they had this technology when mm -hmm. humans encountered the borg humans may not lose so bad to the borg i mean we win eventually but so many people die so really you should catch you should keep preserve the ships preserve the ships however you can well, okay so how okay this was their method to take out the ship right how were they going to disable uh the narada that's the name near a ship yeah. is the narada how are they going to disable the Narada without this method? Because if they don't take it out with the red matter, they seem to not have the capability to take out the Narada at all. 
So this is kind of like a Hail Mary attempt, and they destroyed both ships because they were f Spock was forced to. It, so they blew up the Med Rider, that created the black hole, that pulled the Narada in, pulled the Spock's new ship in, and they lost them both. If they want to preserve them, how would they go about not destroying them but disabling them? I'm not sure they have the capability. Could improvise some kind of like partial red matter thing, but now you're like, I don't know how the containment works. I got it. I got it. Get ready, okay, ready. Okay. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. So on Spock's ship, they have the hypodermic needle where they pull out red matter yep. and put it inside a tube. Do that. Do yep. that again. Teleport it in. Teleport it just, in. Just teleport the red matter into the Narada and then Spock's ship survive. So yeah, you lose the little Narada, bummer. But which would which would have been super good because then you have alien groups technology, but at least you get to save Spock's ship. And that's is Star that, Trek, right? Is that in. guaranteed to work? Maybe a drop works for a planet, but won't work for a small ship. Send a bunch. Just teleport, 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 teleport. Dep I guess if you have a bunch of those syringes. You send. I wonder, could, could you even just teleport a chunk of the of the ball? Just there's a big old red sphere of red matter, and just teleport just directly out. Just send a bit. Or heck, if you, just, if you have three syringes, do it. Yeah. No. I. I. Gosh. I like the plan. Gotcha. I like it, but the fancier you get with the plan, the the less likely it is to work. So instead, just right. ram it. More get it done. Points. Take it. That being said, ram mm -hmm. it. And you got to get close. If you just do a kind of close-ish nearby, then teleport in. That might be even easier. Stay and out can of targeting you, range. Can you teleport red matter? Because I have no idea. the advanced Narada ship had to take it into the syringe and like throw the little probe down into the planet. They didn't seem to use the teleporter to do that. Maybe it's unteleporterable. So. It's and it's the Narada is advanced because it's from the future. Yeah. However, it's a it's a mining ship. Yeah. And so I I would imagine that the this jewel of the Vulcan Science Academy this mm -hmm. is better tech than the Narada. Okay. And I don't know if we ever see the Romulans teleport. Can they? I think they, probably, they, they probably, must be able probably, to. Probably, they have probably, to be able to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. And remember, Earth is on the line here. Like, the Federation is on the line. If they mess this up because they were trying yeah. something fancy, then they lose everything. So a, a guaranteed victory is better than an ideal victory. Unless you could, like, do a quick test that didn't reduce the chances that much to try to save the ships so you could use the tech. Hmm. And then this is your backup. Gosh. So you're saying take a quick trip to Romulus, send little red matter in, see if it works, and then you come back and finish the fight. Yeah, yeah. Just a little, do a little diversion. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, yeah, yeah, wait. So Nero, okay. So Nero almost destroys the Federation. Yeah. He's like fully, fully angry, right? But yeah. in this universe, it, for this timeline, first of all, it's back in the past. And then it's a different timeline. Couldn't yeah. Nero in those 25 years just go to Romulus and be like, oh, the planet's here still. Like, it, it's okay, actually. And in fact, in fact, he should deliver his ship to the Romulan Empire because it's it's high tech compared to whatever this was, however many years in the past, right? And that would give the Romulus, that would give Romulans a huge leg up in the Alpha Quadrant. Mm -hmm. I mean, in which case, they, then he doesn't need to do anything. Dominate, they would dominate Starfleet. He Romulans would do just, and, and he would have helped his people. Right. So he would have helped his people. And then the Romulans would have dominated the Federation, not only the Federation, but the Klingons and the Cardassians and all of them. Right. Mm -hmm. And they would have been able to take on the Dominion years later because mm -hmm. their tech would be so advanced. Mm -hmm. So why didn't he do that? But he did say that they, him and Romulus stand apart. Like he holds a grudge so much that future enemies that haven't been even born yet will not allow him to go take it to Romulus. What? I don't get it. Are you such what? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm very confident that if he showed up, he's like, I'm from the future. I'm Romulan. You're Romulan. I want to give you this tech. Like Romulans be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We like weapons. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They'd be totally. 
even if they didn't turn into weapons or whatever they just use it as a mining ship they made more of the mining ships like yeah we like faster resources we like big ships sure sure no absolutely he decided weird, weird not Nero. to yeah well, Nero is a weirdo studying history holding <laughs> on to grudges <laughs> denialist I'm, I'm too busy reading these books to advance the Robin <laughs> culture <laughs> and, and an amazing captain he holds his crew together for 25 years it's true he's all that over conviction. the place that conviction uh, <laughs> it's inspiring to the crew so kirk wins spock slams the red matter into the narada creates the black hole narada's toast kirk hangs around firing weapons for no reason and puts his entire ship and crew in danger what is he doing armed phasers fire everything we've got pew 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 okay pew, 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 pew. hanging the, out narada's toast like it's done <laughs> Yep. Like, what? Why aren't we at war? We are to send. And if we eject the core and detonate, the blast could be enough to push us away. I can't even promise anything, though. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> ah, so cool. So cool. At the same time, you know your weapons can't affect the Narada. What are we doing? Firing on the Narada. Get to a safe distance. It, it's already in this black hole like it's toast like <laughs> what, are, what, are, what are you gonna how are you gonna get out of this right like no need to shoot actually he could right now just be full full impulse reverse hey quarter right. impulse get us out of here get us out of here nope and he's like no i want to fire on it and i'm sure it has no effect on the narada it's so large I mean, it's it's so advanced you're doing like little pot shots at the narada for no reason i mean even if even if it wasn't pot shots even if you like damaged it and broke it it's already damaged broken like it's, it's already That's it's already right. not getting out of this it's not worth being in not safe distance get him at all get just him, get, get, him. get out of there get him right up. this is almost in a huge blunder by kirk could have lost everybody in the debriefing they'd be like okay kirk kirk let's just, let's just think about this and shoot <laughs> not, you're in space it's not a dissipated medium it's not like you're going to shoot your laser right. and they just disappear like no, no 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 like you're fine like just shoot just back up back up and shoot back up in fact if the enemy is defeated it's back it on us back it on up back it on up <laughs> but but it felt good though i felt it felt, felt good, though. good it felt real good pew 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 yeah it felt great then they ride ride that wave out of there oh, so cool like surf it out but then later on you're like wait did we need to do that Nope. They're like dead in the water now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Call for help. Call for help from the Lorenzian system. Super far away. That's right. And they're confab. A bunch and of do-nothings. <laughs> so right towards the end of the meeting, young Spock encounters old Spock, and he thinks he's his dad, and they talk it out and they see what's going on. But Spock, old Spock, he gambled the entire Federation. He, he, this was risky. He didn't, he didn't, he, he shouldn't have done this. Father. I am not our father. There are nope. so few Vulcans left. We cannot afford to ignore each other. Then why did you send Kirk aboard when you alone could have explained the truth? Because you needed each other. I could not deprive you of the revelation of all that you could accomplish together. Of a friendship that will define you both in ways you cannot yet realize. Hey, let's think about that. So if things had played out a little bit differently, Mm -hmm. maybe maybe kirk got underneath spock's skin too much then they wouldn't have developed their friendship they wouldn't have had this balance where they their, their system where they like balance each other out and the federation could have collapsed this, this is super irresponsible of old spock he's he risked he risked everyone he risked right. everyone on his hunch of like i had this really good friend kirk in my universe which is not this one but in my mm -hmm. universe how things played out things were great so i wanted that for you too but there's no guarantee of that Right, if it had turned out differently and the Federation's destroyed, Spock's like, Federation's destroyed, but you got a buddy now. I mean, he's not even guaranteed to have become friends. Like, right, they're not guaranteed to become friends. They're not guaranteed to survive. I mean, I mean, heck, in, in old Spock's universe, mm -hmm. Uhura kisses Kirk. Like, yeah. it's already different. Oh, well, that's true. That's true. Old Spock, what a gamble! I mean, I mean, so, but it worked. It worked. I mean, okay, okay. It's not a gamble. It's not like high risk, high reward. It's really like high risk, low reward. Because... Oh, I, you're doubting the power of friendship. I can't follow oh, you there. The power of friendship is so. It's 
<laughs> it overcomes. What am I talking yep. about? That's 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 high reward. <laughs> Okay, at the very end, <laughs> you get the award ceremony for a, really a once in a generation talent. This assembly calls Captain James Tiberius Kirk. Captain, your inspirational Captain. valor, bring dedication to your comrades is in keeping with the highest traditions of service. It is my honor to award you with this commendation. You are hereby directed to report to Admiral Pike, USS Enterprise for duty as his relief. Cool. So he gets the cool. flagship. Yeah. I relieve you, sir. I am relieved. Thank you, sir. Congratulations, Captain. Your father will be proud of you. Ooh, he dropped that line. Your father will be proud. Incredible, right? He goes from a cadet to the captain mm -hmm. of the flagship. It's like incredible. Like, but can you imagine? Can you imagine? Can you imagine being one of these cadets in the crowd? Yeah. And you're like, you're, you're okay. You're standing in witness of right. a once in a generational just talent, just an absolute incredible human. And so, like, fantastic, fantastic, because everyone here, I mean, they they believe in Starfleet, and Kirk is clearly good for Starfleet. He saved mm -hmm. he saved the Federation, he saved Earth, he saved everyone, right? But at the same time, like, like fuck that guy, <laughs> right? Right? I right? Mean, right? Yeah, like I'm doing my I'm doing my duties, I'm doing uh -huh, my homework, uh -huh. I'm attending class. Yeah, I'm you get it. Doing the straight and narrow, and mm -hmm. then like, who, th who is this rule breaker? It's climbing to the right. captaincy. What, uh, do I need to start breaking rules? So who but the hell is what, this guy? Wasn't this wasn't this guy like ten days ago? Wasn't this guy we were we were accusing him of cheating? So, wait, cheating. so he cheats on exams. I study for exams. He he cheats on exams, mm -hmm. and then he's now captain of the mm -hmm. of the of the fleet. He's captain yeah. of the of the flagship. And he lies his way onto the flagship and then yells at the captain, gets, you know, thrown off the ship and he gets promoted. What am I doing? Should I be studying or like, like tearing I, shit I've, up? I've been doing I've been doing after school study. <laughs> I've been doing <laughs> after school study since sixth grade to get the grades to get into Starfleet. This guy is like a genius level felon in the Midwest. He gets in a bar, he's, he gets in a <laughs> bar fight and then gets one on one time with with like one of the senior captains. Like, what am I doing? Should, should I what start am, fighting people? What, what is going on what, here? What am I doing? I should be fighting and breaking rules and yelling at captains and disrespecting mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. left and right. Like, should I be studying? Who is it? Fuck this guy. Okay, but at the same time, he's Kirk. He's Kirk, and like clearly this charisma. This wait a minute. I, I work so hard to study. This guy just gets through things on charisma and charm, but undeniable, undeniable charisma undeniable. and charm. So like clearly good. I I want him out there. I want him out there exploring space, setting up a relations with new new species. But I don't get to have these first encounters. What the heck? What the heck? Yeah. Why do I gotta work so hard? To get like an oh, inkling of what he gets, just a little bit. Okay, and and like, we were all cadets together, and this guy—he's not a lieutenant. Uh, he didn't <laughs> get fast tracked a, a little bit faster. Uh. Right, he 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 goes from cadet to lieutenant, commander, lieutenant commander, captain. He skipped he skipped everything in the middle. Not even captain, captain of the flagship. The flagship. Okay, but I, but I get it because like he saved all of Earth through through like through. Guts through through Hutzpa? I don't, I don't know. He, yeah. he he has the right personality to be a Starfleet captain. Like I see it, I get it, I recognize it. But fuck that guy. Oh, yes. mm, I'd, I'd be like, mm, great job. But mm. and also, if this is the personality you want, Starfleet, why are you making me jump through all these hoops? Yeah. Why are you making so, me go through these classes? That's right. Right. Teach me how to break rules. I'm super stressed out about exams. Should I just? Should I be starting fights in bars? That's the thing? That's what you want? Yeah. I'm super stressed out about exams. Uh, ah, you know what I should do? Cheat. Actually, you should get your friend to cheat for you so that way you have a clear conscience. Yeah. That way. And plausible deniability. Absolutely. Plausible deniability. <laughs> but I get it. I get it. Kirk, Kirk is a once in a generation. And even to be yeah. in the presence of like a once in a generation talent, like awe inspiring. Absolutely. Sure. But fuck that guy. <laughs> Cool. So that's our analysis for that's Star right. Trek 2009. And we do have some questions. Questions like, what would have happened to the Alpha Quadrant politics if both of the future ships had been captured by Starfleet? I think Starfleet just becomes super dominant. We don't need to be nice to other people anymore. That's right. I think if, if the Romulans got their hands on it or Starfleet got their hands on it, whoever gets their hands on those two ships, they would have been the dominant power. 
since maybe. since they both blew up or get sucked into the black hole, then Reset. we're still at parity. Parity, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, and what is Kurt gonna do now? I always thought when I saw this, it was gonna be five year mission was next. Mm -hmm. But that's, I guess five year mission is after the next movie. Later. And I think that's mm -hmm. related to our next question is how will Starfleet recover now that one of their two fleets have been decimated? And maybe that's right. why, that, maybe that's why the Enterprise doesn't go on a, on a five year mission yet because they, the Starfleet's uh, just too weak. They're just depleted. They need to like manufacture ships. So they're going to keep everything close to home for defense. Yep. I mean, the fear I so. that would have been created through this whole incident in the public would be intense. Like, like an active call to all humans have babies. We need to rebuild our fleet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Cool. We'll see you guys next time for Star Trek Into Darkness. Into Darkness. Okay, hour and a half. Okay. okay, not bad. Felt a lot more relaxed than in previous recordings. Yeah, for some reason, we'll I don't see. know why. We'll see how it, uh, I hope it comes out. We'll see you in the edit. Yeah. Okay, back to the card. We're ready nope. for pre-stop, closing remarks. Nope, felt good. Uh, my closing remark is that I, my posture is terrible. I'm just sliding the whole time. I see. I don't know what to do. I think I, tr I was very aware of my clean cockpit and I think it was improved. We'll see if that trans that mindset translated into the recording. We'll see. Mm. I think I think we said this is that some uncleanliness in the cockpit is okay. Yeah. Because it does give it a f natural feel. Yeah. You know, like like drinking water. Yeah, okay. It's just yeah. some things that are like, yeah, too much. Too much, yeah. Okay. Then let's shut down. 2024-0816, this is the recording for Star Trek 2009. This is video two of two. 2024, August 16th, movie Star Trek 2009, video two of two. In five, four, three, two, and one. In five, four, three, two, and one. The light cards. Shutting down, 133.30 on the clock. One, three, three, four.